Hi, this is episode 70 of The Case Against with Gary Meese. We're continuing to look at the case of the West Memphis Three, which would be Damien Eccles, Jason Baldwin, Jesse Miskelly Jr., who were convicted in 1994 of killing three eight-year-old boys named Michael Moore, Christopher Byers, and Stevie Branch on May 5th, 1993 in West Memphis, Arkansas. And they're, of course, they're best known as the, the killers are best known as the West Memphis Three. And uh, they were convicted and uh, served 18 years or so and then pled, pled out guilty in 2011 and were released for time served. Now, they've been out for a little while in 2013, March of 2013, which is almost 20 years after the deaths, an attorney presented new allegations based on wild, unsubstantiated tales from a pair of convicted rapists serving time in the Cummins unit of the Arkansas prison system. Sworn statements from Billy Wayne Stewart and Benny David Guy entered into court records as part of an otherwise routine hearing alleged that Terry Hobbs, David Jacoby, L.G. Hollingsworth Jr., and Buddy Lucas killed Chris, Michael, and Stevie after the boys stumbled upon them getting high in the woods. The woods being uh, the woods known as Robin Hood Hills, which is a little relatively small wooded area right next to uh, the interstates in uh, West Memphis, Arkansas. Now the statement mentioned neither Stewart's nor Guy's circumstances. Uh, didn't mention their extensive criminal records. News coverage of the hearing largely focused on the unfounded allegations uh, with most news outlets apparently not bothering to even look into the sources of these allegations and virtually no one except me reporting that these two guys were in prison as convicted rapists long term including one of the one of them is in, in convicted of a rape of a uh, mentally challenged woman child nice guy huh the story made a splash for a day or so and then rapidly disappeared the reason it rapidly disappeared is because it just simply it, it sounded it made really good headlines but there really wasn't anything to it now the allegations were based on an alleged conversation um, alleged conversations almost 20 years before with Lucas and Hollingsworth and uh, L.G. Hollingsworth Jr. died in a vehicle accident in 2001, so he was long dead by the time this came up. Uh, Guy uh, was 53 at the time, 2013, was serving a sentence of 40 years issued on August 5, 1996, for rape, a habitual offender from Crittenden County, which is the county where West Memphis is located. He had pleaded guilty to the rape of an 11-year-old girl in a motel room on May 27, 1995. He was on probation at the time of the offense. He was also sentenced to six years in 1997 for escape, second degree, and had a prior conviction for robbery, for which he was given a two-year sentence in 1994. He had a long list of additional detainers from prison authorities. Billy Wayne Stewart was 39 at the time and was serving a total time of 70 years. Uh, 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 on a sentence from Crittenden County, uh, dating back to 2004, for manufacturing controlled substances with a purpose to deliver, and a five-year sentence also from Crittenden County in 2001 for possession of a firearm by certain persons, i.e. convicted felons, 
He was convicted of a drug charge in 1983, a forgery charge in 1983, a battery first charge degree charge in 1994, and a possession of marijuana with intent to sell charge in 2000, the year 2000. And he, he was in there on a rape charge. Uh, this wasn't the first time that the allegations concerning alternative suspects in the case came from sketchy characters. Baxter County, Arkansas residents Cody Curtis Gott and Christian Blake Sisk, who were former friends of Terry Hobbs' nephew, Mike Hobbs Jr., Terry Hobbs being the father, the stepfather of Stevie Branch and the current favorite alternative suspect of West Memphis Three supporters. And they've been through quite a few at this point. But he's now the current one, has been for a while. Anyway, uh, Gott and Sisk told about the so-called Hobbs family secret in the documentary West of Memphis which was produced by, among the executive producers, was Damien Eccles, one of the killers. They claimed that Mike Hobbs Jr. told them that he had overheard his Uncle Terry say he was involved in the murders. At the time of the movie interviews, Gott and Sisk were on probation after pleading guilty to the February 2010 burglary of Mountain Home High School. At, at, the, at the time I wrote this, uh, they had been arrested for selling drugs as well and other related charges, and they both ended up serving time in the Arkansas prison system after a number of run-ins with the criminal justice system. Uh, last time I checked... One of them was still in prison. I, I just can't. I, I should have looked this up. It doesn't really matter. They, these were two uh, drug addicted punks who came up with this ridiculous story. <coughs> they were in, based in an uh, area around Mountain Home, Arkansas. And they. Uh, They were mad at Mike Hobbs Jr. because they thought that he had snitched on them about this break-in. It really comes down to and And look at how this is framed. It's not that they heard this, but they claim that, that Mike Hobbs Jr. told them that he heard this. And Mike Cobbs Jr., as go on with this, claims he overheard what he interpreted as this. And so we're talking about uh, a, a, the initial source being sketchy to begin, or, or unclear and sketchy to begin with, if it even existed. He's overhearing it, presumably not hearing it all that well. He tells his friends, and his friends tell supposedly tells his friends this and they they spread this as gospel now we have no reason to believe god insists to begin with we don't know what if mike hobbs jr said anything to them and if he did we're not really sure what he said <coughs> but let's let's presume it might not have been what god insists uh, report and then uh, there's always the possibility the, the, there's really strong likelihood that Terry Hobbs he didn't really actually ever overhear anything from Terry Hobbs playing with his brother he was down in the basement playing guitars with his brother Mike uh, that, that Mike Jr. may not have heard anything that got insist just simply made up the whole thing not that unlikely Uh, Mike Hobbs Jr. and his father both denied ever saying that Terry killed the boys. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, Hobbs Jr. did provide information about the break-in uh, that led to the arrest of Gotten Sisk, who had a motivation for re retaliation. 
Uh, even if true, the statements would have been hearsay and of little worth for prosecutors. Uh, based on the Guy Stewart statements, getting back to the two convicted rapists as opposed to the two convicted uh, drug addicts, break-in uh, break artist. Uh, a lawyer for Stevie Branch's mother, Pam Hicks, and she had reverted to using her maiden name after going as Pam Hobbs for a number of years. She alleged that her ex-husband, Terry, his guitar-playing buddy, David Jacoby, and two teens, Buddy Lucas and L.G. Hollingsworth, Jr., who played prominent roles in this case uh, in other capacities, killed the boys in a drug-fueled frenzy with overtones of homosexual dalliance. The allegations came in two affidavits delivered to Judge Victor Hill at the end of a hearing on access to evidence with lawyer Ken Swindle urging that the information in the 80-page packet be considered before making a ruling. And uh, the, the information in the packet had next to nothing to do with what they, the object of the hearing, which was that um, the late, now late, John Mark Byers and uh, Pam Hobbs Hicks wanted to have access to some of the evidence in the case and they were being denied this evidence. Uh, which doesn't bode well for Bob Ruff wanting to prosecuting attorney to hand over materials in the case so Bob can go get it tested for DNA. Um, I mean the parents were denied access to this evidence. Luke, uh, and this was a hearing in uh, Marion, Crittenden County Courthouse. I was there, and the judge turned down this request, but they used it as a, this was, seemed to be mostly an opportunity. Apply, there, were, there was quite a bit of media there. And that seemed to be a, a platform for an opportunity to spread this really ridiculous allegation about Terry Hobbs and these other three. Lucas in 1993 told police that Miss Kelly confessed to him the day after the killings. Uh, Lucas quickly recanted, but a polygraph examination indicated Lucas was lying when he claimed there was nothing to his story. In other words, he described a great deal, great deal of detail what Jesse Miskelly Jr. told him the day, the morning after the killings, with tears in his eyes about he'd gone to uh, West Memphis with and uh, Damian and Jason Baldwin and messed up some boys. Uh, And Lucas said, "Oh well, you know, I, that, I don't, I didn't really mean all that." They give him a polygraph. He continues to deny, "Oh yeah, I, I really didn't mean all that." And every time he says, "I didn't really mean all that," that didn't happen. The polygraph indicates he's lying, which means essentially that he, uh, the story uh, about the confession, is true. Now, Hollingsworth was questioned so extensively in the case that he became known as the fourth suspect. In fact, he was freaking out about that at one point. Uh, he really thought he was going to somehow get pulled into it. <coughs> Though, there, uh, there was nothing explicitly tying him to the killings at all. He did live in the area. <laughs> he couldn't really give a very good account. He gave the absolute worst accounting of himself. Out of all the people, all the bad witnesses and bad statements, as far as coming up with uh, just a sensible explanation of where you were and what you were doing, uh, 
L.G. Hollingsworth was by far and away the worst. Uh, just all over the place. Uh, most notably, he was seen at a laundromat not far from the killing site. He came in, he was dressed in a white shirt and a tie. He was starting a new job the next day, but nobody knows why he was wearing a white shirt and a tie that evening. Driving a car nobody had, nobody had seen before. Uh, and wanting to get Dominique Tears' phone number from Dixie Hufford. Uh, why he wanted to get Dominique's number, we don't know. There's no, according to Dominique, he didn't call her that evening. He saw her that, he had seen her that day, and he was going to see his Dominique the next day. Dominique was some, sort of his cousin, but not really. They weren't related, but technically they weren't related by blood or marriage. But, for instance, Dixie Hufford was related to Dominique. I think she was her aunt. And Dixie Hufford was L.G. Hollingsworth's former stepped grandmother in other words his, not his grandmother but his grandfather had married Dixie at some point and then got they gotten divorced or maybe she was a widow but apparently she was divorced her name was Hufford it wasn't Hollingsworth and um, but LG can still considered to be Dixie his grandmother, so to speak. And most famously the Hollingsworth clan was headed to the laundromat that evening to pick up pick up Dixie and saw Damien Eccles standing by the side of the road about nine twenty, nine thirty that night, walking along actually by the side of the road, 9.30 at night, covered in mud. One of the better witnesses against him at the trial. So all this stuff, there's a confluence of things going on here. But, that is, I covered L.G. Hollingsworth at great, great length earlier. And uh, I won't try to, I, I'm not going to get all into that again because it's too complicated. You can go, go back and look for the episode on L.G. Hollingsworth. It would take an hour to explain all the stuff going on with L.G. supposedly that evening. Now, Benny Guy's statement, one of the rapists, said he visited Billy Wayne Stewart in Lakeshore States. Lakeshore States being the trailer park where uh, Jason Baldwin and Dominique Tear lived, where Damien almost virtually lived. He actually lived in West Memphis with his parents, but he spent so much time in Lakeshore. It was might, you might as well have said he lived there. It was where J Jason and Miss Kelly Jr. met Damien and Jason uh, that that evening and walked over to Robin Hood Hills and killed the three little boys. Anyway, Buddy Guy said he visited Billy Wayne Stewart on May 5th, 1993 and was he was working on a stock car when he saw Lucas and another teen get out of a truck driven by two adults. Uh, then Buddy Lucas bought some marijuana from Billy Wayne Stewart, according to Guy. Uh, so that was a sighting on May 5th, 1993, which is the date the boys were killed. Guy said Lucas later moved in with him in Walls, Mississippi, which is in DeSoto County, just really just south of Memphis, Tennessee. A guy stated in March of 1994, while working on a plow at Robertson Plantation, I asked Buddy, when those people, those people 
come to talk to you about them boys that was supposed to got killed. Did you do that? Buddy dropped his head and didn't want to look at me. He looked all sorry and upset and said, yeah, and nothing else. I said, little bud, you know you can tell me now. I ain't going to think no difference of you. But he just kept looking down, all sad and quiet. So I asked, what did you do? He then said, me and L.G. Hollingsworth and two men, we was there with them boys. We did it. Benny Guy described Buddy Lucas as pretty bad slow. I'm putting on a little bit of a southern accent, but honestly, I don't have to work it too hard. A guy described how Lucas confessed again later when he moved in with Guy's family briefly. Guy said that in April 1995, he told Stewart about the confession and Stewart confronted Lucas, who described the circumstances of the crime. And then Benny Guy wound up in a jail cell with L.G. Hollingsworth in July 1995. Guy said, When I told L.G. that Buddy had already told me that they had killed the boys, his whole attitude changed. L.G.'s face relaxed and he looked like a boy who was proud of what he had done. He did not show any remorse or act sorry at all. Guy said Hollingsworth described how they bought marijuana for Hobbs and Jacoby, drove around getting high and drinking, <coughs> and went into the woods. Hobbs talked the teens into wrestling each other. After the three boys spotted the men, the three boys, the Michael, Chris, and Stevie, spotted the men, Hobbs ordered the others to hold them, said Guy. One of the boys kicked Hobbs, who went into a rage. He began beating the boy, with the others joining in beating the others, according to Guy's statement on Hollingsworth's account. Then they pulled the boy's pants down. Hobbs pulled out a knife and cut the scrotum and penis of a boy. Then they tossed the boys into the ditch, along with their bikes and other evidence. In his statement, Stewart described how he and Hobbs began using the same dope dealer in the early 1990s, with Hobbs eventually buying his meth, cocaine, and marijuana from Stewart. Stewart's account, given to an attorney representing Hobbs' former wife, described Hobbs as bisexual and said he witnessed Hobbs kissing Jacoby when they came to his house in Lakeshore for a marijuana buy on May 5th. He described a similar kiss in another drug sale and said Hobbs and Jacoby were holding hands at a well-known and now long-closed gay bar in Memphis, J-Wags, at another drug sale. Stewart knew Lucas, whom he also called Little Bud, and described him as obviously slow. Stewart said, in April 1995, Benny Guy told me that Buddy Lucas had confessed involvement in the murders at the Blue Beacon Woods. There was a Blue Beacon truck wash next to the woods, so it's also known as the Blue Beacon Woods, in addition to Robin Hood Hills. Stewart said Lucas told him much the same story as Hollingsworth told Guy, with the added suggestion of sexual activity. Stewart said, when describing the smoking and the drinking, Buddy dropped his eyes and paused as if he was ashamed. He would no longer make eye contact. Buddy would not have been ashamed discussing marijuana or whiskey, which led me to understand that there was more going on between the boys and the men than what Buddy had just told me. At this point, Buddy's speech slowed. Gone was the little bud that I had grown to know and love. Stewart said that Lucas told him that Hobbs bit the scrotum of one of the boys after Jacoby began beating him, then took out a knife and cut the child in the groin. Both convicts said they attempted to alert authorities but were ignored. Jacoby has denied any involvement in the murders and has never been a suspect. 
Lucas, who was not a suspect, had an alibi for the times of the murders when questioned by police in the initial investigation. Uh, his family was holding a chicken cookout, uh, since there's no real reason to think that he was, police had no reason to think he was actually involved in uh, the murders. They did a lot of checking of a lot of people. <coughs> despite despite the all the talk about how they focused in on Damien Eccles and no one else, well, that just simply, that's not how it was done. They talked to a lot of people. They polygraphed a lot of people. They talked to, talked to uh, Buddy Lucas, and Buddy Lucas said his family was having a chicken cookout that evening, and it, it actually uh, invited uh, Jesse Miskelly to join in, but Jesse was left and was walking away. Uh, he described him as walking north, which would have been away from uh, Lakeshore Estates Trailer Park. But he, he said he was walking away around 5.36 that evening. Hobbs has never been a suspect. And the whole unseemly episode was generally seen as a way for the Hicks family to humiliate Pam's ex-husband. And please understand that Pam's, not everybody in Pam's family, but she has several sisters some of her sisters have a deep animus toward Terry Hobbs. It'd be obvious if you saw the uh, Bob Ruff. I think I think they were in the Bob Ruff episode. Maybe I think maybe they traded off. One was in the Oxygen special, and one was in the um, A and E special. But uh, the a couple of the sisters really, really have it in for Terry Hobbs, and they'll they'll say anything they can to humiliate him, make him look bad. And it's really hard to imagine something much worse than uh, describing him. Uh, you know, this that he and Jacoby were you know homosexual lovers. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know these men well. I know I know of them only, you know, mostly what, you know, from the case. And uh, but uh, I've never. I think uh, Jacoby has a whole bunch of kids, and I guess maybe he wouldn't be the first guy who had a whole bunch of kids and and could be homo, could be gay or bisexual as well. But the fact is, is nobody. Nobody has ever suggested that he has any of those tendencies. Except these guys who didn't know him and, and had an incentive to come up with this ridiculous crap. Terry Hobbs, I, I don't know when, you know, there's very little detail in the, these this story. And, and it's understandable in a sense because they're describing what they allege was told to them. So it's already second, third hand, and then it's told, you know, it goes on and on and on. But the thing is, is there's very little detail. There's no timeline here. There's really nothing except these outrageous uh, slander slanders against uh, all four of these men. There's never been a suggestion that Buddy Lucas is involved in these killings. There's no evidence he's involved in the killings. Uh, L.G. Hollingsworth Jr., for all his sketchy ways and, and uh, inconsistent statements, and, you know, he was, he, they, he was somebody who came under a great deal of suspicion because of his way, his ways of dealing with the police. But the fact is, is there's no evidence that... L.G. Hollingsworth was involved in uh, these killings at all. Now, he, he did know uh, Damien Eccles. He did know as a dominant tier. He was around them that day. He, uh, Damien Eccles, he's one of Damien Eccles' favorite uh, potential suspects. 
uh, on May 10th, Damien Eccles was asked who he thought did it. He said L.G. Hollingsworth. They asked L.G. Hollingsworth who he said who he thought did it, and L.G. said Damien Eccles. These two guys really didn't like each other, but they were around each other a lot. L.G. apparently had some sort of thing for Domini, though Domini has said that uh, there was nothing between them and they were just cousins, friends, whatever. And from her standpoint, I suspect that's correct. Uh, probably not from L.G. and since L.G.'s dead and apparently a really grisly, according to his aunt Narlene Hollingsworth, who was the primary person who sided Damien Eccles on the side of the road, uh, L.G.'s head, he was decapitated in this auto accident in Memphis in 2001. That's what she told me. I... I Looked, I mean, I, I did check check in news reports and so forth on on, on the, the the accident. And he he did die in an auto accident, I think, with a big truck. But you know, I don't know if he was decapitated or not. And usually, <coughs> unless you really unless you want to go and get into the medical medical examiner's records and so forth, uh, and it's not that important. You know, I don't know if he was or not. Uh, Terry Hobbs is, I've never seen any other suggestion that he has any sort of homosexual tendencies whatsoever. He has always been, he's always indicated that he's interested in women and there's not been anything else that's ever come out that would suggest that anything is really stupid, really ridiculous stuff. They're, he and Jacoby are kissing each other at J-Wags. Uh, this, is, this is the kind of thing that, uh, you know, you would sort of as, as expect from a really vindictive ex-wife who's trying to humiliate her ex-husband as much as possible. Uh, but I really don't think Pam was the primary uh, source of this. I do think it was her other family members. Uh, and they have some reason to resent. They actually have a lot of reason to resent Terry. Uh, he did shoot their brother in a fight. And the brother eventually did die, possibly from complications from that shooting, though it was many years later. So, you know, they had, there was, there was some reason for the resentment, but the, they, they apparently never liked him to begin with, and I, I, I suspect he probably didn't like them. He, he's a little more close to the vest on his feelings about them. I think he would prefer they just go away. Um, anyway, uh, you know, I, Jacoby, you know, did have a wife. Uh, that was home that evening. His, his family members say that, you know, this couldn't have happened. It didn't happen. This is ridiculous. And, of course, Jacoby was upset at this hearing. He Kind of famously, there was some film footage of him, you know, really kind of escaping from reporters. He didn't know how to deal with it. Uh, Hobbs is a little better about this. Uh, John Mark Byers really leaped upon this and was pontificating in a really bombastic way, in his usual bombastic style for the TV cameras that, that afternoon. Uh, it was on the local news. I, I don't know how far it spread beyond that. Uh, and as I say, it, it died within a day or two because there was nothing backing it up. And that's even without people really delving into this, looking at what the source of the story was, which is two low-life scumbags, the worst of the worst, sitting in an Arkansas prison system with nothing else to do, 
maybe hoping they're going to get some kind of deal out of this. Uh, and they pick on the extremely nervous, high strung David Jacoby, the, as they describe him, slow, uh, also extremely nervous and downright scared Buddy Lucas, who didn't testify at, at the trial because he was just simply too scared to do so. Ron Lax helped, helped build that fear in him. He was scared to even speak to police or prosecutors at a certain point because he thought he was somehow going to get pulled into the case. You got L.G. Hollingsworth, who's dead, so he can't defend himself. And uh, he had, apparently he may have pulled, according to his aunt, Darlene, uh, he may have sort of pulled himself together somewhat uh, by the time he died, he, by the at the time of his death, he was still a young man. But, you know, he certainly had a sketchy past and, and uh, a lot of funny stuff going on. But I won't say there were some, there were some suggestions he was in a really weird relation, weird sort of relationship, if you will, with uh, an older friend. That's a very strange sort of guy. He certainly they hung around with all the time. I don't know what that was all about. Uh, neither did anybody else really. Uh, and then we've got Terry Hobbs, who is he's fair game because he is the favorite alternative suspect. So you can, according to the supporters, you can say anything you want to about him. You can describe any, you know, take anything he's ever done and twist it around to make it sound just as bad as it could possibly be, and that's okay. And, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm sure he's made his share, of, and I have no doubt that he's made his share of mistakes. I think he's said so as much himself. Uh, there's things he's reg he regrets. As uh, anybody who gets to a certain age, if you don't have things to regret, you really didn't do a whole lot of living. But uh, the idea that he, that he was involved in all this ridiculous garbage is beyond belief, literally. Anyway, that's the four perp theory as it's known. Uh, We could. I, I didn't really even get into the Hobbs family secret, but there really isn't much to it. So we'll just leave it at that, and we'll leave you with well, well wishes. Uh, stay safe. Stay well. Hopefully this pandemic shutdown will be over with. And within a month or two or three or four, we can all get back to normal. I'm kind of tired of it. I don't know about you. Anyway, that's all for me, Gary Meese. I do want to mention that this is from my book, Where the Monsters Go. Uh, it's a second volume in a two-volume set. The first volume is Blood on Black. I have a combined, revised, condensed an arguably improved version called The Case Against the West Memphis Three Killers. Uh, it's, I will say it's condensed and revised. It's a little more readable. It's not as complete as the two larger books. Uh, for I mean, rather obviously, it's about half the size of the two larger books. So... Those books are all available on Amazon in print edition and also in Kindle. The Kindle's more affordable, frankly. As I've mentioned before, the print the print cost just to print the book is expensive. So somebody's gotta pick up those expenses. So if you buy that book, you're picking up the expense for the printing. I mean, we're not giving it away. Uh, Kindle's a different issue, and uh, it's much more affordable. Anyway, thank you again. 
I'll talk to you again soon. We're getting down to uh, probably the last few episodes in this podcast as far as the West Memphis 3 go. I am going to I am planning to do some supplementary episodes, getting into some aspects of the case that uh, you know I, that I think are interesting. But I I didn't want to fill up a, I didn't want to fill up a book with that material, uh, and um, I think you know a lot of people will find that interesting. And then I I do plan on moving on. Uh, looking at some other cases that uh, have been handled in somewhat similar fashion as the West Memphis Three. In other words, an extremely propag- propagandistic, misleading, misdirecting fashion. A la Paradise Lost, a la Devil's Knot, a la West of Memphis, a la Bob Ruff. Good evening.